first day two of Comic Con. Oh my gosh. So much good stuff. I love you too! <laughs> Welcome to the Walking Dead panel, which is technically the Talking Dead panel, if you want to be technical about it. Um, so, uh, just a couple of announcements. First of all, the season six premiere is the largest episode to date. 654 Walker extras used during shooting, second only to the pilot. Uh, and you can see the episode of season six when it premieres Sunday, October 11th at 9 p.m. Um, I want to point out this will be a 90 minute premiere, so yes. Uh, and then Talking Dead will be on at 10.30 right after that. Uh, also, we're going to do a Talking Dead Season 6 preview special hosted by me on Sunday, August 23rd at 8pm, uh, during which we will give more exclusive first looks at what's in store for the season. Also, there's going to be, uh, you can catch up on your seasons 1 through 5 with 5 Sundays, 5 Seasons Marathon. Each Sunday, AMC will air a single season of the series beginning Sunday, July 26th at 2.30pm. So just cancel everything now, don't go anywhere. Uh, to invite people over or board up your doors. Um, and that, that is through Sunday, August 23rd. But um, most importantly, I, I want to thank you guys because without the fans and the fandom, first of all, my show wouldn't exist. You all wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to bring these people out here and show this to you. So thank you so much for supporting Walking Dead. Um, we, uh, we wanted to change things up a little bit, and so we pulled in a bunch of questions from social to ask, so it's not just me uh, blabbing up here. I will be blabbing with your questions, uh, so I have some lists of those. But first, I, let's just get into this. Uh, I am very happy to show you the first look at the official trailer for season six. Uh, so everyone, please have a seat. Let's let's get into this. So uh, Kirkman, as you know, uh, the, the poor man fell a bit ill, and he was not able to attend Comic Con this year. So uh, he's now here in t-shirt form and mask form. Yeah. Yes. Uh, hand me one of those. Those are yeah, yeah, He's mean, actually here. Any questions that come up? I got to I kind of prefer these <laughs> versions. Can we just take these off? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Everyone have one. We should definitely throw one of these into the audience. Uh, so, uh, okay, uh, before we get started, right? Yeah. Let's do this. Uh, what, how how big is Hall H? About seven thousand. Seven thousand people. Yeah. Now it would be great. Hello, Hall H. Uh, it would be great to have the premiere somewhere that could hold this many people. Right. It would be even better if we could hold it somewhere that would hold twice as many people. Right. It would be thrice better. Right. If it could oh. hold about two and a half amount of this people. Where are you going with this math problem? The Walking Dead premiere is going to Madison Square Garden. Yeah! In October, all these people can, can conceivably come if... With their friends and family. With friends, family, loved ones, well-wishers, Go to www. That's H H T P. Please do the whole oh, URL. Yeah. <laughs> backslash backslash. No forward slash www. forward slash. W W A M C. Backslash is for local Ted. files. <laughs> AMCTheWalkingDead.com. Come join us in New York in October for the biggest premiere yet. Yes, amazing. Thank you. I think, I think that section back there is like shit. We don't live in New York. <laughs> guys, this is amazing. I mean, Madison Square Garden is about 20,000 people, so uh, go. that's gonna, that is the best way. Because even just seeing you guys react to the trailer, and you have to understand most of us watch this on like computer screens, you know? Oh, so to, see it, to see it in a room like this, with a screen like this, with a crowd of everyone freaking out, it's definitely an experience, and we, we really appreciate it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to launch into fan questions. Uh, before, before you do that, I just, oh, want, I just want Robert to react to everybody watching it on a computer screen. <laughs> Okay, sorry. I just want to react. This I, is Robert reacting to anything. All right, so let's get into this. This is uh, this is from uh, R Dash Venkat. Will this is for the producers? Will season six explore a power struggle between Rick and Morgan? It kind of seemed like that from the trailer we saw. Or or will it more so be portrayed as a fundamental challenge to the way Rick has always been leading the group? Oh my. Um, well, it certainly seemed that we were selling that in the teaser, uh, the trailer rather. I will say 
that this is a savvy audience that knows that we sometimes play with the truth in trailers. Right. What? It's true. It's true. But it's just to maintain the experience for everybody. I, I would say that uh, Rick absolutely is faced with, uh, with challenges to the way he does things, and also including these people in the, in the way that he does things. At the end of season six, he wanted everybody on board with him, and everything went very well in those last few moments, up until... Well, except for the dickhead that he shot. Except yeah. for the porch dick. Yep. <laughs> I'm so glad that became a thing. Yeah, that's you. No, it's not me. No, really. No, it's Corey. It's not me. No, no, it's you. Oh, no, I said it, but then that, that poor guy has to live with that for the rest of his no, life. No, Corey Brill is not a porch dick. He just plays one on TV. He did. You know, like a week afterwards I saw him and he was like, by the way, thanks, people are shouting porch dick at me wherever I go. <laughs> Well, and he's a really nice guy too, he's a lovely which man. made that funnier. Um, but uh, so you, you're saying that there that things might not be as they seem. Things might not be as they seem, but Rick uh, absolutely has to deal with the fact that things went down with Reg and with Pete and all these people who might have been following him into the bowels of hell are maybe looking at him a little differently. All right, this, uh, this question is from Carrie Frazier. Uh, will we get to see some more flashbacks in a character pass? I'd like to know more about some of them, like Glenn or Sasha. All right, Dave Alpert, you want to take that one? Do you know? No? Okay. You don't want to say anything? Scott? Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, we can see more flashbacks. There are other characters, Glenn, um, Sasha. There's a little bit of flashback. Where there's definitely some playing with time, but uh, not quite as much as last season. Okay. Uh, next question, this is from idan25. Will the wolves from season five finale finally play a big part in season six? Uh, the wolves will be a part of season six, hopefully in a way that you don't expect. All right. Chris. <laughs> good almost answer. Yeah. Uh, this one's for Andrew Lincoln. This Hi. is from... Hi, Andrew Lincoln. How are you? Hi, Can I just say it's so lovely to see you all again. Hello. Doing in my front room. It's crazy. It feels like I can't believe another year has gone by already, and we're here. It feels like we were just here. I oh, know. Like I felt every single day. <laughs> <laughs> well, this first question's uh, this first question's uh, a hardball here. Uh, Dil Dylan Hinchy wants to know: Do you think Rick misses the beard, and do you miss having the beard? Uh, my wife doesn't miss the beard, but um, uh, yeah, I think that was one of the most weird filming days of my life when I had to shave, well I had to get in, into a shower naked in front of my crew. But you offered, you offered to get in the shower naked. Yeah, but, <laughs> but then apparently you can only see, two, what is it, two inches of my butt crack. Is that right? Is that a fish? The, there, was, there was no crack. <laughs> no. Charlie Collier, Collier can confirm this. <laughs> what are we allowed to say? Uh, uh, but yeah, I had to do that and then I had to shave and look in a mirror. The most painful part was actually looking at my face while shaving, because I don't enjoy that experience anyway, but to do it on camera was just unbearable. Um, but yeah, I miss that beard. Uh, and I'm gonna grow it back as soon as possible, Scott Gimple. <laughs> how, much does, well, how much does having that beard become sort of a prop for the character? Like, when you have the beard, it does, does it inform the way you approach the character as opposed to when you shave off the beard? Well, you... well Stephen Young looked at me when I shaved it off. He said, you look like you have a shrunken head. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny, which Tiny kind of thing. unnerved me for the afternoon filming, really. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it does. It became part of him, you know. And also, I, I remember sort of two seasons before, Scott actually talking to me and just saying, we want to get these guys to the lowest ebb. And I thought, well, the great way of doing that is Seeing how big I can, bushy I can grow my beard. <laughs> nice. It's like, just like Scott Kempel right now. Yeah, look, I'm look working at that. on it. <laughs> this is so this yeah. is adorable. Oh, uh, yeah, that's, that's exactly what. You know what? Somewhere, you just touching my cheek like that, Robert Kirkman is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> that's usually his job. I will say that the beard, both in the comic and the show, really is sort of a metric of where Rick is at. Right. And uh, when Rick shaved the beard when he went to Alexandria, I mean, we, in, in the comic, we completely mirrored that, and it was in a mirror, and the, I can't believe people laughed at that, thank you. <laughs> I, I uh, but I will say that the beard, the beard will continue to inform and sort of indicates a barometer of where Rick is at. Right. Uh, this, this is this, this man's Twitter name, uh, at 
the fat guy, uh, wants to know, it's his Twitter name, D-U-H, fat guy, uh, what's the dynamic going to be like between Rick and Deanna this season? Obviously the last moment was very impactful, so wh where are they at this point that you can say? Rick? And Deanna, He's yeah. covered in blood at this point. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I think that there's a, there's a genuine respect between the two leaders, between Deanna and, and Rick, and it, a lot of the last sort of three or four episodes, you saw a man restraining his instinct to lead and to show these people, and then as things start to, uh, you know, they, they real, he realizes that he's amongst innocents and people that don't have any experience of out there. I think, you know, we got lucky. The, the gates were open. You know, we got walkers. I had a, a zombie shower at the end yep. when I blew his brains out, and um, and then, and then of course, you know, when Pete came in, he uh, slashes Reg, and I and I shot him. Yeah, but that was it. Wasn't just that you shot him. That that was Deanna. It was an execution. Acknowledging yeah. you were yeah, you were she right. Did say, do it. Yeah, I was going to do it anyway, but, uh... <laughs> well, then that, that just means you guys were sympathetic. Yeah, that, that's true. Yeah. yeah, but that was, that was, that's the struggle between the whole time, is you have this insulated community that thinks that things can still be the way they were before the apocalypse, because they're clearly lying to themselves. They're weak, they're not trained, they don't understand what the world is like. You guys come in and effectively sort of pollute them for the better, but you had to show them that this is how things have to be now. I agree, and I think, I think certainly a lot of the themes, it seems to be... Is, we're exploring this season about them and us, you know, inside the community and outside as well. Yeah. And, then, and then you have the wild card of Morgan returning just at that moment. Yeah. And what he's seeing, a, a very different Rick from the last time. And a different saw. Morgan as well. And, and, and a Morgan, we don't really know at this point. Yeah. We don't really know what he's up to and what, what's going on and how he's been changed. But he's damn good at fighting with that stick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is for Denai. Uh, this is from Aisha Grimes on Instagram. What do you think Michonne's opinion is on Carol's housewife disguise and her lying about stealing guns in Alexandria? Ah, huh, that's an interesting question. I've always yearned for more interaction between Michonne and Carol. Woo! I'd share it with 7,000 people and my boss at the same time. Because <laughs> um, I just, I adore uh, Carol. I think it's such an interesting thing between these two women. I think their two tactics of how to handle this world is just so, it's so interesting. They, they're both, having tactics, but they're, they couldn't be more different. I think she really is just catching up with where Carol is, and she has a profound pers respect for Carol. So she understands that what Carol's doing is for the good of the group, and it, it's definitely about protection. It's definitely about keeping us you know, on top and keeping us safe. But it's just not the way that um, Michelle wants to, to grapple with things at this moment. She's looking to actually merge community. But she's not gonna get um, you know, into a big tussle with her like she didn't in that scene. She just acknowledged that's where she was at. And she was really getting the landscape of where everyone was. But I mean, I was, um, I would, I'd love to, to hear them converse about their different ways of seeing the world. So this is sort of a two-part question. What, what do you think Michonne's journey was in the last season? And especially that last thing with her and the Catan, like sort of embracing that again, where do you think she ends up? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is. It was really fascinating, actually, because she was very. She had made that decision in in se season four, where she literally decided, "I'm actually going to stop being this isolated character who like goes off by herself, grabs two pets, and will go and venture into the world and be alone and hang out with walkers for the rest of my life and not be vulnerable to anybody." And making that decision to turn around and say, "I'm going to re-embrace my people and I'm going to re-embrace whoever I can and and actually move forward with life." And that's scary, and I have no idea what will happen, but I'm going to do it. That uh, is kind of where she's been going. She's been consistently kind of going on that track. And so the idea of reconnecting with these people, which was kind of a miracle for her, and really affirmed her choice. But then throughout last season, it was this sort of fear of we were just kind of getting broken down, like you know the terminus people. So that trust was like obliterated. And then it's like going into you know the idea of going into what happened to Bob, and it was just constant, like what happened to the church, like it was just the constant breaking down, and then she started to see people like Glenn start to get broken down, and how his psyche started to shift, and stuff like that, and the idea that we could actually get to the point where things could get, like we actually all turn into where she's been, was very scary for her. Yeah, it's interesting because it, it, it just shows the importance of this, of this group of people, because there's always this sort of 
sine wave of sanity where it's like, oh, Gabriel's not doing so great. Sasha's losing it. Rick's, I'm not sure. Right, right. Okay, Michelle's good. Carol's good. Ah, she just threatened to murder a kid. You know, like, so right. it, it's sort of like, <laughs> You guys kind of need each other right, to, to really keep out. the balance. I feel like Michelle was a very, she was a very calm presence throughout and almost right. sort of resigned at the end of like, ah shit, here we go well, again. Well, yeah, I mean, it was this crazy thing from like the, the, the moment of actually, you know, saying I'm going to neutralize Rick, which to me was like this really like disturbing moment to play. I was like, oh dang, I got to punch I got to punch Rick? Yeah. You know, but, um, you know, strangely, you know, we had a good time with it, right, Andy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such a weird moment to have to do, but it was, it was like that breaking apart of saying, I think differently from you and I'm going to do something different from what you do. You did hit me. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, that was the best for take. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she hit you for real? For real. Oh, that's oh, great. And she jumped on me after they, they said cut and just cut. I felt bad. <laughs> that's good acting. What are you talking about? I thought I'd really knocked him out. Uh, um, but, you know, at the end of it, when we actually, you know, picking up that sword again, that was when you realize, okay, I have got to balance this out because there's no way I can put my weapon up there and walk away from my power. When right. pe other people pick it up and use it for bad, I trust myself to use it for good. So oh, that's, that's interesting. So it wasn't for you, it wasn't even so much like a battle weapon as like a protection from other other people, I've never even considered that. Yeah, it's, it's well, it's, it's it's it is a protective force if I'm using it. Right. But if someone, some other dude, porch dick, picks it up. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not going to be picking anything up at this point, except his brains off the sidewalk. Um, but it, I hope everyone's caught up. By the way, that was a huge spoiler. Uh, if you're not, you shouldn't be in here. All right. Um, <laughs> This is, and also, it happened months ago. Watch TV faster. Uh, and, and Chris, let me just take this moment uh, just to tell the audience that I was completely lying about the flashback question earlier. <laughs> and uh, there actually be a whole lot of flashbacks. <laughs> really? In the first half of the season. And in fact, I'm, I'm working on an episode right now that's entirely a flashback but I just forget things in front of 7,000 people. All right, so I don't know if this version is the truth or the previous version is the truth, or is that supposed to throw it's us off? This is the truth, it's, yeah. You're a web of lies, yeah. Scott Gimple. I'm incepting. <laughs> Stop it, here comes the kick! All right, uh, this is for Steven. This is uh, Furious Beast on Instagram. I'm gonna paraphrase this question because I really wanna know this. Why didn't you kill Nicholas? I want you to kill that guy so bad. I want you to kill that guy so bad. <laughs> And he totally deserved it. Time and time again, he was almost saying, please kill me. I'm a complete douchebag. I want to die. And at the end, you somehow found some humanity and mercy. Why did you not kill him really hard? He's got beautiful eyes. <laughs> Never even thought about that. Mercy into his soul. Uh, I don't, goodness, you know, um, Glenn is a better person than me. I, I also said, why, why did you not kill him? Um, but it's a very it's a very complex situation. It's it's um, it's layered in the sense that you know it's Glenn is seeing a version of himself in him. Uh, Glenn also realizes what it means to cross that threshold. Uh, Glenn also sees uh, 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 in that moment that he has won. That he has he has it, it serves no function in that moment to kill him. Uh, it's not like he's making him an example for others. It serves no function to kill him except for himself. And if he crosses that threshold, I think he looked into his face and saw an earlier version of himself, uh, another iteration of himself, if he were to live within these walls, and he saw what he could have been. And for him, it was a chance at hopefully having him be redeemed, but at the same time, I think it was mostly Glenn trying to save himself as well. Because if he crosses that line, it's kind of game over for him. His MO at this point is he, got, he found a place where him and his wife can, can, and can be there, can, can live there, can search for the life that they've always wanted. And part of that also includes humanity. It includes living the life that they previously had, which is not some wild, wild west where if someone crosses you the wrong way, you kill them. Granted, he shot him in the shoulder, but um, like I said, Glenn is a really good person. <laughs> and then he stuck his finger in the bullet hole yeah. and then beat you up. 
Yeah. Yeah. It let four walkers. And then the other people at the warehouse. Like, and, and, he, and, he and he lied shoes about. in the house. He yeah. wore the shoes in the house. And he just rude. <laughs> he double dipped. You guys were at that cocktail party and he double dipped yeah, in the. Double-dipped. Yeah, he took a bite and then went back into the salsa. Doors. You should have killed him for that. He's the one that revolving doors. He doesn't, he doesn't like push. push he doesn't push. Yeah, he doesn't push revolving doors for yeah. you. He, um, he, it's, it is a complex situation, but ultimately I think. Um, Glenn was trying to save any part of the old world that he could, and that includes his own humanity. Does Maggie keep him tethered to that world? I think they both have that together. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, Lauren couldn't be here, and she loves all you guys, and she couldn't be here because she's visiting family, but um, know that she loves every single one of you. So, uh, but. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely do feel like Glenn and Maggie keep each other grounded. They have a very symbiotic relationship and, and they overlap on many things. And one of those things is to preserve what semblance of sanity and humanity that they have so that they can be together in a safe and new world um, together. This next question is for Lenny James. This is from, yes. Lenny James, first time for the Walking Dead cast on a panel. Uh, and I have to say, the thing that was so wonderful about your character and seeing you come back is, from all the seasons, people would always say, what happened to Morgan? You know, when you were just a sliver in the beginning, and people always said, where's Morgan? And I think in our heads as fans, we were like, he's out there somewhere. And then we saw you in clear, you were like, he's not doing well. Uh, but it, it definitely showed a dimension, or at least, at least maybe even a little bit of foreshadowing about what can happen, particularly for Rick. So, what, what do you think he was doing this whole time out there? Well, what do I think Morgan was doing yeah. this whole time? You know, he was painting. <laughs> <laughs> he was getting to know himself. Um, I think he was, um, well, we may find out this season what Morgan's been um, doing with himself, but, um, uh, one of the things he's been doing is trying to find Rick, and um, and at the end of the last season, he find, finds him and kind of wished that he hadn't. But um, yeah, I think we're going to find out where, possibly, where Morgan's been and what he's been up to. This is from uh, Alison Loveland on Facebook. What kind of effect do you think Morgan's presence will have on Rick? Oh, um, I don't know, to be honest. I think um, Morgan and Rick have a particular kind of man love that kind of goes on. <laughs> And, um, Keep going. <laughs> I think the the, um, the fact that Morgan has gone to find Rick. I think one of the I've said it before, but it's one of the things that's most important. Is Rick is the last person left on the planet that Morgan that knows Morgan. Everybody else who Morgan knows is gone, and the only man, the only person left that Morgan knows is Rick, and that's why he goes to find him. And um, I think Morgan's aware of the effect that Rick has had on him. Um, I don't know now because they meet at such a kind of important moment at the end of the last season and this season there's going to be fallout. Uh, this next question is for Chandler Riggs. Mr. Chandler Riggs, welcome. Uh, this is from Brandon Reese one on Twitter. Do you think Carl feels at home in Alexandria? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Carl, like, I, I think he sees Alexandria as a, a restart button, kind of, just to try and start over and live the life way, the way life, life should be lived. You know, that's, that's how he sees Alexandria. I love that, just that moment with, those, with the other kids there, or there's, there's like video games, you're like, what have you people been doing <laughs> this whole time? I mean, you have, even just in your short time in that world, you're already a soldier, basically. So how do you think he's processing, how do you think he was able to process like, oh, it's okay to be comfortable again? Well, I mean, that's, that's what he kind of like went into shock when he walked into that room and, and it was just like, like, like it was years ago, you know, back, back when the, the apocalypse started. And I think for him, you know, first of all, he, he sees their vulnerability and, you know, although Alexandria is a safe place, people still know, need to know how to survive in case there is a threat outside the walls. Uh, so he, sees, he sees their vulnerability, and um, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. And, this is about uh, you, not me. You go. <laughs> and so, um, but but I mean, he, he does. He has sympathy for for the kids living in Alexandria, and he wants to show them 
how life is outside the walls. This is from uh, at Ash Actually. How do you think Michonne would feel about Carl sneaking out of the gates following Enid? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> okay, who are you asking? You, either of you. Actually, I'd love to hear you both tackle that. Okay, you go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, well, okay, so I, I think Carl sees Enid as, as another survivor. He, he's, she's the one person in that place that gets it, that gets how, uh, how it is outside the walls. And so, you know, he, he can obviously relate to her, and so that's why he enjoys going outside the walls and just hanging out with her. But, you know, obviously, being outside of Alexandria isn't very safe. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't know how they'd react if they knew Carl was running around with Enid in the woods. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> Probably better Michonne doesn't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But I mean, I think there's the thing that Michonne really loves about, about uh, Carl is that he has such a survivor instinct and he's so smart and he knows how to take care of himself so well and so she was always just able to kind of relate to him like like a friend which i think the idea of him going outside there is like you can't imprison him in, in one sense like you can't say you may never leave these walls I, I think that she would find that to be a disrespectful way of treating him but at the same time you know her her gut her instinct her, her wants for him of course are to keep him extremely safe at all times so she wouldn't she probably just doesn't want to know, but she can want to know at the same time. Well, they're also just teenagers in the apartment. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, if, you're a, if you're a teenage boy and there's a teenage girl, even if you're like, oh my god, there's zombies at the gate, if a teenage girl's like, let's go out there, you'd be like, yeah, okay. Like, there's no... <laughs> it's like, it, this whole concept of you're still human beings. Like, you're still, you still do things that human beings do. Right. Um, this is a really great, just a, a really quick answer for this one, uh, Chandler. Uh, at Hyatt's Loris wants to know, if season five Carl had a chance to tell season one Carl some advice, what would it be? Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, really. I, I think just, I don't know, because I'm not really sure what, what he would tell him. Don't just kill the walker in the swamp yeah. that killed Pam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Shoot, shoot the one and shoot the one walker that you should have shot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Way to make him feel bad about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, this is first Nico Martin Green. This is from Twitter. Uh, after Sasha's breakdown last season, which you portrayed amazingly, she says parenthetically, what do you hope she finds in season six? Oh my, healing, restoration. Can she at this point? That's a great question. You know, yeah, I mean, she's hit rock bottom. You know, it's, um, it's been an honor uh, for me to portray PTSD um, in honor of those who have suffered from it. Um, and that's, that's what you hope. You hope that there is light at the end of the tunnel. You hope that you can cross over to the other side and uh, find a reason to live again and not just live, but thrive. And so that, that's, that's what I'm hoping that she finds is, um, is a way to respond correctly to the deaths of, of, of her most loved ones because it, looking back on it, um, she were to get to that place, that, that healed place, she would look back and see that I, I didn't respond correctly. You know, I, I have not been the woman that, you know, my brother, really knew and, and loved and insisted that I still was. I, I have not been the woman that Bob fell in love with. I haven't been the woman that even, you know, our father raised me to be. And so now it's, it's time to actually uh, pay homage to their, to their lives and their memories and, and, and live with hope the way they would have wanted me to and the way that they did. This next question is from Melissa McBride. Uh, <laughs> from at Hello Sydney on Twitter. What is Carol's biggest challenge in hiding who she is slash what she is capable of from the Alexandrians? So what's the biggest challenge between? Between being able to, basically concealing your identity, because Carol was amazing. I mean, the chameleon transformation to just immediately like, just an innocent house mom in a sweater, like, I, it was instantaneous. She saw the situation, she assessed who she needed to be in that situation, and she adapted like that. And so, what was the biggest challenge, do you think, for her in, in maintaining that persona? 
You know, I, I, I think just not having her cover blown. Um, she had really important work to do, you know, finding out who these people are, what they're capable of, what they're not capable of. I think really just the biggest challenge was, was keeping her in cover. Um, yeah. This is from at DC uh, and DPS. We didn't get to see Carol react to Tyrese's death. What did it mean to her? Does she miss him despite everything? Mm -hmm. There's an echo, I'm sorry. We need to see Carol react to... She said, uh, we didn't get to see Carol react to Tyrese's death. So, what did that mean to her, and does she miss him? Yes, she misses him. It's, it's, every death is heartbreaking, and it just fuels the fire even more to become stronger, fight harder, to keep everybody safe, including herself, and... Everything is fueled by the loss of people. That's why she's doing what she's doing. She can't stand around and watch people die. You know? And she's ready to pay the price, go to hell, whatever she, she doesn't know. Who knows to, to do whatever she can to try to help people. What, is that what keeps her going? The need to help people? I mean, she's not a cold-blooded killer. She just wants to keep going so she can, you know, uh, come face to face with somebody else she can put down. <laughs> That's what I'll do tomorrow. Maybe we'll intersect with somebody and I can... Yeah, no. Take him down. <laughs> this is for Michael Cutlets. Um, this is from... This is an amazing Twitter name. At Hey Donuts. Uh, when do you believe your character's defining moment was? Hmm, that's a great question. Um, I think it's the defining moment is yet to come. Um, oh, <laughs> says the crowd. I might agree. <laughs> Thank you, good night. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to live in a world where Carol bakes cookies and gives flowers to everyone. <laughs> this is from at McBride TWD. Cutlets, what do you admire most about Abraham? What's your favorite, what's your favorite quality? I, th I think just his pure honesty. Um, it just is what it is. You know, there's no, uh, there's no filter. There's no agenda. There's no nothing going on behind the scenes. It's, it's kind of, uh, you know, what you see is what you get. And if you don't like it, that's too fucking bad. Nice. <laughs> He, he does get the he does get the best written dialogue yes. on the show for sure. Every time you get the the scripts and you see things that Abraham says, they're always they're always great. The last the line you had in in sixteen was like he don't know shit about shit about was one of the, I'm not gonna remember the line because he said it so well. I had it recorded for a while. About sand. It was it was great. It's, he has the, he has the best dialogue. I just like hearing you guys kind of talk. It was shit and it had to do with Sam. Sand shit. <laughs> There's a vast ocean of shit. Yes. That you people don't know shit about. Rick knows every fine, fine grain of, of sick shit. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Deanna? Yes! Oh my god, amazing! That's all, Michael there. Who's Deanna? We were not like rolling around the, the, the writer's room with that. You know, like that's, that's Michael taking two words and making them into an epic film. I think that was, that was partially my fault because when he said it, it was so quiet in that scene. And he said it so loudly that we all kind of laughed. There's like some drunk guy in the back going, who's the Anna? No, that, happen, that happens when there's 17 actors on set. There's a scene going on. They put you way, way, way in the back. You weren't that far in the back. And you have to back. deliver the line. <laughs> you weren't that far in the back. You <laughs> are. <laughs> you could have cut that into the last shot of the, of the season finale. It's like, blam, and then just cut to cut this. Who's Deanna? This is one last time. Uh, this is for Norman Reedus down there at the end. This is from at Jenny Agio. Is there anything special that you do to get into character for Daryl? Uh, a lot of motorhead, um, <laughs> a lot of coffee. Yeah, stuff. I uh, play Candy Crush a lot. Nice. <laughs> I actually 
actually do believe that Carol would, uh, that uh, Daryl would enjoy Candy Crush. I'm so into it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and I spent hundreds of dollars. I don't even. Do <laughs> <laughs> and well, after you just said that, now if they don't send you stuff, they're assholes. No, no, no. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you guys send me lives on that. I play forever. It's great. And then second part to that question, Jenny wants to know, what's your favorite emoji? Uh, I like the red balloon. <laughs> I knew it would be a good answer. I, I you knew it. Yeah. Is that my qu fucking questions right now? Everyone really? <laughs> has these deep questions that I got candy crush and emojis. Like... I want, you know, I wanted to throw you the hard balls. <laughs> Okay, great. Okay, you know, I do, before, right before we go to the audience questions, we'll have time for a few audience questions. I, I, do, I do have one serious question for you. From at Immortal Dixon on uh, Twitter. Which is the darkest season for Daryl in terms of his sanity and morals? I didn't hear that. Please. God damn it. <laughs> that was too hot tough. That was too tough. Okay, which, which is the darkest season for Daryl in terms of his sanity and his morals? Of se season? Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Um... You asked for it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Wow. We can um, we can do more emoji questions. <laughs> I'm, I'm better at those. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's there's it's it changes all the time. I mean, the first one I kind of found the the character in the first scene that I was on, and then I started to to trust these people when Rick says I'll go with you to find your brother. And I was like, okay. And then that took a while. And I remember like putting a little hand in Stevens handbag that was fun um, but it all changed it. and where we ended up last year when Morgan comes back with us and Rick's shooting that dude in the head um, we had that scene you know just before that where yeah it was Carol and Rick and I and you know they said you know if this town can't can bend a little bit we're just gonna take it so I was thinking in Daryl's head when he comes back and he's shooting him in the head like oh, it's on let's take the town so, I, I mean, there's a little bit of darkness all over the place that pops up all the time. <laughs> that just needs a red balloon emoji to brighten yeah. the day. And some candy crush lines. <laughs> I hey. swear to God, if Daryl came into a scene and be like, hey, y'all, maybe we should just play some candy crush, that, that would be... They don't have that yet in their world, but... Hey, hey, Chris. Yeah. So Lauren Cohan just sent me a text that she wants me to read to everybody. Please. It says, Dear Greg, you're the greatest Purdue. Wait, no, no. No. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for reading this note out loud. Now, can you please pass it to Stephen to read? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, for real? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> She's very, very funny, by the way. She's cheeky. Uh, she wrote, Steve says this uh, I miss not being there with you all at our sixth Comic Con. I'm with my family right now, but my other family is at this table and in this room. We may have already said this today, but everyone in here is who makes this show and inspires us to new Walker Kill, emotional roller coaster, fighting for life, and love heights every season. And we thank you and love you so much. I hope you all have a freaking incredible weekend. Can you say something funny at the end? <laughs> And then, and then it says, then please give the phone back to Greg. <laughs> I didn't read that part. Well, Greg actually did, you actually did bring something to show people that was a little extra, didn't you? I did. did you no, it? It, well, it, it seems like we're having a blooper right now here, Greg. We are? Yeah, so what could it be that we're having a, a real blooper about? Uh, let me... Oh, maybe there's clips of people that didn't get their lines right or broke character exactly. or... What? Now we 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 every every year at the rap party, you know, even episodes that I'm directing when when characters do something funny, you know, the show is always so serious. So anytime we have an opportunity to do something a little light, I always tell Amy Lacey, the script supervisor, like mark that as a blooper. And at the end of the season at the rap party, we screen the blooper reel for everyone, and it's. It's really just a, a great emotional release to laugh with our characters and see them uh, do fun things. So we, uh, we have something to show you guys. Great, roll the boomer reel. <laughs> hey Mike, hey what's happening? Uh, what's your, uh, what? dude, oh. you think you're a big hand for Mike. I saw him <laughs> e in the evening, first spot in Hall H, camped out there. Uh, yeah. 
What is your uh, What is your question? Uh, well, there's a short little one and then uh, one for the cats. Melissa, I can smell those cookies all the way from here. Right? Uh, and also, that I want to. disgusting. Okay, well, <laughs> the, the cookies are right there. <laughs> Anyways, I want to ask the guys uh, what are you more afraid of, the mega herd or the wolves? I want to ask the cast. Well, I don't know if we have time to get everyone in some okay. questions, but it's a couple people. Uh, are you more afraid of the wolves or the omega herd? Uh, I'm not. I'm not particularly afraid of anybody at the moment. Well, I guess that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, they they should be afraid of us. Yeah. <laughs> Said very authoritatively. <laughs> I think they should be afraid they, of they us. They should. They should be concerned for for us. <laughs> they should be mildly upset. Uh, what do you, What do you think, Abraham? Wolves or uh, mega herd? Bring it. Uh oh. Yeah. Wolves I mean, can hide. Yeah, that's true. I mean, wolves are Birds they're sentient beings. Like they, they can hunt and stuff, and walkers just rah, you know. So I would I say think I'm I'm more concerned with the living than the dead. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, good to see you, Mike. I'll see you later on. Uh, what is your name, madam? Um, my name is Bibiana. Um, I just wanted to ask Chandler, what did it feel like being back on set? Did you feel nervous at all or excited? Well, I'm. Uh, I think we're all we were all pretty excited to come to come back on on the show for the new season. You know, it's um it's great to be back working on the show for most of my life. So, <laughs> That's a literal thing. It's uh, it's you know all I've known for a while. But no, it's um it's fun. I I love this show. Excellent. Thank you. Hey man, what's your name? Hi, I'm Daniel. I'm a big fan. Um, I wanted to ask, who's going to be the next cast member from The Wire to make an appearance? <laughs> <laughs> who's the next cast member from The Wire who's going to make an appearance? That's a Robert question. Yeah. Uh, 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 we... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll just say, uh, we tried for... S I, I'm not going to do a Robert impression. Uh, we tried for someone this year and it actually didn't work out, but there was... I I'd say we, we aren't through with that cast yet. <laughs> yeah. Actually, did you want to? Talk about another cast. Did you want to make that yes, announcement? Yes. Do you want to make this announcement right here? Oh yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, in addition to uh, Corey Hawkins as Heath. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody picked up, but we have Ethan Embry, which was in the trail. We're really excited to play the first episode, and uh, we've cast Merritt Weaver uh, as a character from the comic, but you'll have to wait to find out who. Yes. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Obviously. Merritt Weaver as Negan. Yes, <laughs> yes, obviously. Uh, yes, ma'am. What is your name? God damn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to startle you. <laughs> well, my name is Jillian, um, and I guess this is more directed to um, Andrew and Denai, but I find Rick and Michonne's interactions fascinating, and I wanted to know what is Michonne to Rick at present, because it kind of seems like she's the only one who can check him. So, it's just... That is very true, yeah. My mom, I just want to say, but my mom is desperate for Rick and Michonne to get together. She's like, she'll be watching this now, she'll be very happy that I'm saying this, but she goes, when, if you had any political balls, you've got to get those two people together. She, she gets a bit, uh, she gets quite fired up about it. Uh, but that's not, I'm not campaigning, Scott. No, no, I, and I've received the calls from your mom. <laughs> I agree, yeah, Michonne is a, is a fellow warrior, he respects her so much, you know, and they've been through so, so much, you know, and he, he trusts her with, with his life and with his children's lives, and uh, so I think that, yeah, like many of the characters now, there are certain sort of planets, there are five or six that he looks to, um, and he can be checked by, and she is certainly one. I think for Michonne, I mean, she, he was actually the person who checked her in the very beginning, um, like an episode clear, and um, even before then, when she just, she was kind of buck wild, and uh, she just fought the governor, and he was gonna kick her out. That whole moment where she knew she had to change was because he checked her, and that caused an indelible respect that I think just keeps reverberating through their friendship. Excellent. Uh, hey, button lady. Hi, Chris. What's happening? Hi. Uh, thanks for naming your horse after me. Um, my question is for Carl Papa. 
<laughs> and uh, Chandler, uh, la not this last season, but the season before, you had a very, very intense scene. I was wondering if any of your cast members gave you any advice for that, if you had a closed set, because I, I don't know many young actors, know of many young actors, who could have done the scene that you did. It was amazing. Uh, did you get any help, and did you have to have a closed set? Was it the scene with... Uh, with your dad sleeping. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, I don't know, I, I just do it, I just say the lines, I do it. We go to him, he's the most mature man on the set right here. Okay. No, um, no, but it's, it's, it's hard for those intense scenes like that. I've had a lot of them throughout, throughout the years, and it's, it, it is hard doing those scenes. I, I think we've all had pretty, pretty intense, intense scenes along those lines, and, I mean, it's just it's just one of the thing one of the things that you just gotta get through and and pull yourself through it. All right, thank you, button lady. Hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Nai. And what's um, your question? Well, there is um, an upcoming quick kiss between two certain people. Um, that was a little bit unexpected because everyone is expecting that certain girl to kiss another certain guy. Um, <laughs> But I just wanted to know, with, with that kind of an intense scene, how do you relieve the awkwardness of a scene like that on set? Can, can she repeat the question a little vaguer? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a guy, and this guy's got a thing, and then there's this girl, and she's Wait, what, like, show, what show is she talking about? Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's dead. <laughs> he's not coming back. He's dead. It happens in shows sometimes. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> Unless he comes back as a walker. What? <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Are you, so you're asking what's it like to kiss somebody on set and uh, leave that on set? No, I'm asking um, how do you relieve the awkwardness of doing an intense scene. Oh, how do you relieve the awkwardness of doing an intense scene? The kissing part was a red herring. Oh. Wait, I'm so confused. <laughs> well, look, I, so the blooper reel, I think, was pretty self-explanatory with that kind of thing, because there were so many intense scenes, but it seems like that there are moments where they kind of break out of it a little bit, and they're all, because everyone seems to be you know, family, basically, that it's kind of, at some point, it just sort of breaks down to like, oh, we're just sort of screwing around with our friends and we're safe and, you know, and we're laughing or like, you know, even when Andy punches the wall and he's like, oh my God, I'm sorry. Like, those, those kind of moments, I think, relieve the tension where everyone snaps back into reality in a second and then you guys have to get back into it. I mean, you would have to or you all would go crazy. And it, it, this is, you know, there aren't a lot of horror shows that go on and on and on. And this cast, the thing that blows me away is that these guys live a horror movie every week, and they've been doing that, some of them, for six years. And uh, that, there's a bit of a psychological cost to that. And that's, and that's six months a year. Yeah. And, and hopefully we'll continue to do so for many more years. That's the plan. That is the plan. I was just talking about so I could keep working. I don't know why you were... <laughs> and, and the psychological toll that Chris has. It's so... You know what? There is a psychological toll for my show. Because I never realized that I would be America's damn zombie therapist. And that when your favorite character dies, I'm the first stupid face you see. And I feel responsible. There's like someone will die. And I'm like, uh, shit, well, I didn't do it. That's, uh, that's because you tell us. Come on, I mean, what do you got for me? I need some more drama for I, I have to tell dad. everyone that everything's okay. I have to be like, okay. It is, it is like, funny, like, finishing an edit of something, like, really heavy, and we go right to the end of the reel, and you just picture Chris, like, stepping out in the avid, kind of like saying, it's gonna be all right. Well, the talking dead, the hashtag is Herschel's crazy stump or something, and everyone's like, <laughs> everyone's like, shut up, you're ruining the show. Wait, we have it, Daryl. Yo, well, hey, Daryl. Daryl Hello. 2, what is your uh, question? Yeah. Yeah. Chris, I just want to say that you always do an amazing job. Um, my question is for my hero, Norman Reedus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, thank you, Norman. That makes me feel great. You can always 
bring me up on stage too, that's cool. <laughs> Tweet at me, I'll send you that picture. Um, okay, okay awesome. so what's your question? Question is for Normus. What kind of character development can we expect to see in season six for Daryl? First off, did you just call me Enormous? <laughs> I did, maybe that was a Freudian slip. <laughs> you know what, the, mi the minute you stood up, I knew I liked you. <laughs> Norman, you better send that guy a balloon emoji. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. What love are you on, candy cost? I don't play, unfortunately. Starting on Monday. Yeah, before this weekend's over, you and me, I'm gonna teach you some cake. <laughs> Hell yeah! Is so, this getting weird? No, not at all. <laughs> so, uh, so we're, real, real quick, where, where's Norman? Go, where's uh, Where's Daryl going? And then that'll be the last question. Level 275. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, there, there's a whole. But I don't, you know, the thing about Alexandria is he didn't want to go there at all. He doesn't like anything to do with suburbia, I don't believe. Um, but it, it, he wanted out, and then he found a place that they could handle him and gave him a job, and he sort of felt like he could fit in and wanted to fit in and wanted to fight for it. Um, and that might go crazy later. <laughs> it, it, there's, there's, you know, he's going up and down all the time, and I think he sort of finds... Uh, his safe place with these people, so it gets tested quite a bit. Hey, what's that walking by back there? Hey, hey. Yeah. All right, cool. So just two more quick pieces. Of, <laughs> two more quick pieces of business. I'm like starting to freak out. There's some Daryls walking next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> two more, two more pieces of business before we wrap this up because we have another another panel. Do first of all, Greg, uh, I'm told that you brought a couple of. Uh, Exclusive pictures that you wanted to yeah, show. Yeah, we brought some Walker pictures. You know, uh, some of the some of the stats in the in the first episode we actually of, of season six, we did more Walkers than we've done in any episode ever. So a couple a couple of these guys, you know, we got a little more rotted. We actually uh, we have one zombie who's nicknamed the Bernie Wrightson zombie. So uh, you can probably get a sense of uh, in Comic Con who Bernie Wrightson is. But uh, these are a couple uh, a couple other characters that we've done, and again, sort of going for way more. Uh, rot. Every year we get more and more uh, decomposition on these guys. But first episode, we had one day where we had three hundred. We had three hundred watts. Greg directed the premiere episode coming back, by the way, which is important for you guys to know. Which again is ninety minutes. October 11th. And a lot of people don't realize that the season finale last year was supposed to be a 60 minute episode, but Scott wrote the script. The script was so well written. Again, you know, each premiere sort of launches our characters onto their, into their stories, and then we wrap them up in the finale. So, <clears throat> so last year's season finale, when we were cutting it together, it really, we needed to, to wrap those stories up, so it ended up being an hour and a half. So now, of course, Scott and I went to breakfast. He's like, so remember we did so well with that hour and a half finale? What do you think about doing an hour and a half season premiere? So we have a supersized episode right out of the gate. Excellent. And then, do you want to make an announcement about the international premiere? Yes. Um, first of all, we, as Scott and Chris have said, um, this really is our year to celebrate the fan. And we are also celebrating international fans. And as per usual, our partners at Fox International um, channels will be premiering it in 125 countries, 250 million households, within 24 hours of its US premiere. So for all of you who aren't here, but have traveled a long way, you will get all these fantastic episodes really soon after after you've seen them here. Excellent. So, you guys, thank you so much for coming out to the Walking Dead panel. The Fear the Walking Dead panel is going to be in a couple minutes. I'll be back after this. Huge hand for the entire Walking Dead cast and producers. Sunday, October 11th. We'll see you there. And then also... Okay. And then if you guys want, uh, as they're walking out, I can show you the trailer one more time if you want to see the season six trailer one more time. Everyone, Walking Dead, huge hand! And as everyone's walking off, let's show the season six trailer one more time and I'll see you in a couple minutes for Fear the Walking Dead in just a few minutes, all right.